In this screencast, we will be looking at tissue repair or wound healing. This topic may be found in chapter three of your textbook. The objectives of this screencast are as follows. Describe the inflammatory response. Describe the formation of granulation tissue. Compare and contrast regeneration and fibrosis. When you are injured, cells are destroyed and tissues are damaged. This is the case whether we're talking about a burn injury or a laceration or a puncture wound. Cells are destroyed and tissue is damaged. Therefore, the process of wound healing or tissue repair involves replacing the destroyed cells and restoring to the extent possible the tissue to its original form. This process involves three events. They include the inflammatory response, granulation tissue formation, and regeneration and fibrosis. We will now look at each of these events in detail. I will be using the following figure to explain the process of tissue repair. And as you can see, this wound has occurred in the skin. However, do understand that uh, the process that I'm going to describe would occur in response to internal injuries as well. The first process that occurs in response to damage to cells and tissues is the inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response is one that you are very familiar with. If you've ever hit your head and a knot rises up on your head, or you have uh, cut yourself and the area becomes uh, warm to the touch and red and a little swollen, then you're familiar with the inflammatory response. Basically, injured cells release chemicals. And these chemicals act as sort of a 911 call by the cells alerting the body that, hey, we have damage and the body needs to respond. Those chemicals cause nearby capillaries to become leaky. That is, they become very permeable. And they basically allow all of the content or most of the content of blood to move out of the capillaries into the surrounding tissues in the area of the wound. As this happens, the area becomes reddened, it is warm to the touch, and swollen. And also, pain receptors are stimulated by those chemicals that were released by the injured cells, so the area is also painful to the touch as well. I want to take a moment to contrast the inflammatory response with a or an immune response. An immune response is a very specific response to a specific bacterium or virus. The inflammatory response is a generalized response. This response as described here would occur if one were cut with a knife, a laceration, or a puncture wound, or a bruise, or abrasion. It's a generalized response to injury. Let's continue talking about the inflammatory response. So we said that those nearby capillaries become leaky. They allow antibodies in the blood to move into the area of injury to uh, destroy any foreign cells like bacteria or viruses that have entered the body through the wound. Also, white blood cells move out of those capillaries into the area of injury as well to destroy foreign cells. Platelets and clotting proteins also move out of those capillaries into the area of injury. They clot the blood and prevent further hemorrhage from any severed blood vessels. 
And they also wall off the site of injury so that if there are microorganisms that enter through the wound, they won't spread to uh, adjacent tissues. The blood, any blood that's exposed to the air eventually dries and becomes a hard scab that prevents further invasion of the area of the wound by microorganisms, and it also uh, helps prevent further hemorrhage. Lastly, fibroblasts move into the area and they begin forming collagen fibers. Due to the actions of the inflammatory response, a blood clot has stopped any hemorrhage that helps to patch temporarily the area of injury. We have a scab formed at the surface that not only patches the area temporarily, but prevents further invasion of the body by microorganisms. White blood cells are in the area to get rid of any microorganisms that entered during the process of injury. We have a nice supply of oxygen and nutrients to the area. So now is the time to replace the old cells that were destroyed with new cells. Just underneath the scab where we had epithelial cells destroyed, we have epithelial cells migrating into the area to replace those that were destroyed. In the case of deep wounds, below the epithelial lining, fibroblasts begin laying down collagen fibers to help close the break. This process can be sped up by implanting sutures, or what you know as stitches. Macrophages, which are a type of white blood cells that phagocytize objects, will begin digesting away the blood clot as new cells replace the old cells. Remember that a blood clot is mainly a temporary patch to replace uh, those cells that were destroyed. As the new cells are beginning to be formed, the blood clot is removed by these macrophages. To support all of this activity, new blood vessels capillary specifically, begin to sprout and move into this area to provide a steady supply of nutrients and oxygen. And so these capillaries extend just below the scab. This new granulation tissue is very tender. The capillaries are very superficial. And that is why if you pick a scab, it typically results in bleeding because those capillaries are just underneath the scab and very tender and subject to uh, rupturing very easily. At the end of the wound healing process, all of the cells that were destroyed have now been replaced with new cells. And this replacement of old cells with new cells comes in two forms, regeneration and fibrosis. If the cells that were destroyed or the tissue that was destroyed is replaced by the same type of cells and tissues, this is called regeneration. In this example, epithelial tissue that was destroyed has been replaced by epithelial tissue. This is regeneration. When we have deep wounds, the original tissue is often replaced with connective tissue, or what is known as scar tissue. Scar tissue is strong, but the downside is it typically lacks the flexibility of the original tissue. And more importantly, it often is not able to perform the normal functions of the tissue that it replaces. So for example, if scar tissue forms in the wall of the bladder or the heart or another muscular organ, it may severely hamper the functioning of that organ. 
Most injuries involve both regeneration and fibrosis. Which one predominates really depends on the specific tissue that was damaged and the severity of the injury. In general, the more severe the injury, the more fibrosis occurs. However, there are certain tissues that are more prone to regeneration uh, than others. Let's take a moment to look at different tissues and their ability to regenerate. The tissues that regenerate best include the epithelial tissue, bone tissue, areolar, dense connective, and blood forming tissues. Organs that contain large amounts of these tissues are least likely to be permanently affected by injury or damage. Smooth muscle tissue also regenerates fairly well. Tissues that don't regenerate very well include skeletal muscle tissue and cartilage. Nervous tissue and cardiac muscle tissue do not regenerate at all. This is why if there is damage to the heart, which is exclusively where cardiac muscle is found, there is permanent loss of function because any cardiac muscle tissue that was destroyed will be replaced by scar tissue. And scar tissue doesn't have the same properties as cardiac muscle tissue. Now let's review the objectives of the screencast. Describe the inflammatory response. Describe the formation of granulation tissue. Compare and contrast regeneration and fibrosis. The next screencast covers the topic of developmental aspects of cells and tissues.